Well, Witi Tame Hemaida Smiler, better known as Witi Hemaida, is one of the best known names in New Zealand literature. Most people will have at least one book penned by the Gisborne born novelist. Short story writer and playwright, stories like The Whale Rider, The Matriarch, Sky Dancer, Knights in the Garden of Spain. Witi Hemaida was the first Māori writer to publish both a book of short stories and a novel. He is a te Aotearanga Amahaki descent with close affiliations to Tūhoi, Te Whānau Apanui, Ngāti Akuhungu and uh, Nai Tamanuhiri. He was made a distinguished companion of the New Zealand Order of Merit uh, in 2004 for services to literature. And in 2009 he received the Te Tohu Atikitiki A Te Waka Toi Award, the highest honour given to martyrdom in the arts, and he received an Arts Foundation Laureate Award the same year. His 2016 memoir, Māori Boy, won Ockham New Zealand Book Award for non-fiction. 2017, he was honoured for his fiction with the 2017 Prime Minister's Award for Literary Achievement. He's worked as an academic and writer for many years at the University of Auckland and the Monaco Institute of Technology, but these days, at 74, is writing full-time. Woody, great to have you on. Well, kia ora. Uh, Wallace, then. I what always, an intro. Well, I always uh, listen to your show on Sundays. I mean, I'm one of those people who doesn't, you know, sleep in with my partner or my boyfriend or my girlfriend. So, you know, so I do watch it. And your row is pretty good. Oh. You know, I mean, I love uh, listening to Radio New Zealand and, and hearing the row spoken. So, you know, Taika Waititi might have to think a little bit more carefully about what he says about how people, you know, can't pronounce uh, um, Māori because. You you done good, boy. <laughs> well, we try here at RNZ, but sometimes I think we can do better, you know. Well, everybody can do better. Mm. And it's such a pleasure to see you in a, a kind of gizzy jacket. What do you think? Well, the tweed. You know, I used to wear that stuff way back. <laughs> what is it? It's what, 1949, you were saying. You got it. <laughs> You're the man. You got it. This yeah. is an old um, naval uh, tailor's um, uh, uh, label that's been reinvented. So it's back to that old style of New Zealand. Um, Governor Mackey, the style of New Zealand that, you know, in a sense that you write about uh, a lot in, in, in your work, you know? Yes, well, my work in those days when I was writing uh, way back in 1970s was all about Māori um, in rural areas and cow cockies and shearers and uh, um, and uh, fleeceos and people who were um, cutting scrub, as you probably will have known if you saw Mahana. So your jacket just goes with the period. Oh, kia ora. It's nice, it's nice, nice to hear that, would be. Hey, it's, it is really hard to know where to start with you, such as uh, your, in your extraordinary career. But I'm going to start with something new yet old, and it's the newly restored digitised version of the 1976 uh, Winners and Losers TV series, an anthology of stories from some of our best writers produced by Roger Donaldson, Ian Mew. And one of your stories as part of the series, um, tell us... Uh, about big brother, little sister. Well, you sound surprised that it's in that lineup <laughs> <laughs> because it is an amazing lineup. You know, it is, um, isn't it? What they did was that they adapted um, short stories by Catherine Mansfield, by um, Frank Sargeson, and uh, by um, Morris Duggan. So there were, you know, uh, quite some brilliant uh, authors there. And then there was little old me from Waitohi. Uh, so Big Brother Little Sister was part of that uh, that series and I was so proud of it because um, the whole series itself was the very, very first um, drama series um, that Television New Zealand had actually commissioned and um, all kudos to Roger Donaldson and to Ian Mune. And so Ian uh, directed this piece and he actually directed it here in Auckland. So when I was watching it, I thought... My God, it still holds up. It could be Auckland today. It's about a, a boy and a girl who are escaping from a, a very, very terrible situation. You know, their their mother um, is uh, a woman who's trying to bring up uh, two children by herself, and she gets involved in these really bad relationships with men. So it's a, a really contemporary Once Were Warriors story. Very contemporary. Yeah, mm. but it's Once Were Warriors 1972 mm. style. Mm. Why do you think they chose that one, Witty? Well, I think that they probably um, chose it because they were looking for something that was um, up to the moment. Um, most of the other stories in the series uh, were not um, urban or um, not contemporary in that same way. Uh, What's amazing is, is is that even in those days, it was very difficult to get Māori actors. So uh, 
Roger and Ian were so lucky to get Don Selwyn, for instance, and Sue Hansen, who plays the mother. Yeah, big, strong man. Why don't you just get out? So what we're seeing here is the very, very beginnings of a Māori film and television industry, as well as a New Zealand um, product. This was a prime time uh, drama series creating, uh, celebrating our own literature, groundbreaking in fact that, you know, you're the only living writer from that series. Do you think, Witty, that there's a place for something similar uh, to be created for television today? I mean, you mentioned Taika, so there, there are some big things happening, but in terms of that prime time dramatic series like that, not really. Oh my God, am I the only one living? <laughs> oh, well, you know, I mean, things are always darkest before they become totally black, I suppose. <laughs> well, um, yeah, how can I answer that? Since then, since that time that um, um, the Winners and Losers series uh, was on, we've had this huge amount of, of film and, and television um, in the New Zealand and film and television industries. And each time there is something like, for instance, Once Were Warriors, mm-hmm. like um, The Fastest um, Indian, um, like a Whale Rider, like Tyker's work, uh, Boy, and of course, uh, you know, his, his great uh, hit, um, Hunt for the Wilder People. Every time we get that, what we get is a new way of looking at ourselves. So I'm very, very proud that I was able to create at that time uh, these opportunities mm. to to look at ourselves, and subsequently, um, there were two other um, uh, films, documentary television films that were made out of my work, and then uh, after Whale Rider, there was there were, there were another three. One of them was White Lies, uh, a second one was Kawa, and then the third one was Mahana. So I've been really well served by television and by film. The exciting thing is then to see people going overseas and, and doing absolutely mm. magnificently like Taika. What do you think of that? Well, you know, New Zealanders can do anything. I mean, really, we can um, go out into the world. In fact, we are New Zeal- uh, we are New world um, uh, leaders. Um, there's no doubting that Peter Jackson is an icon of uh, New Zealand film. And there's no doubt that Taika is and Roger is and Lee Tamahori is and um, Jane uh, is. You know, there's all of these people who are working on the um, uh, the international stage. And then we have Nikki Caro, who's just had, having this amazing uh, career. Um, what's interesting is that Taika is going into the Marvel Universe uh, with Thor and then We've, we've now had in, in Thor this fantastic movie called Blank Panther. Have you seen it? You know what? I have not seen it. I have heard and read the buzz about it. Apparently it is extraordinary and has reignited a whole new population, a whole new segment, rather, uh, of demographics for, you know, big cinema. Have you seen it? I have seen it. What and, do you think? Uh, and I'm really inspired now to write something that's rather similar, except that it should be based in, in the Pacific Um Ocean and probably about Polynesians and a Polynesian mythology, because what excited me about uh, about Black Panther was that in many ways some of the the subtexts and some of the um, the look of the film was very very much like um, uh, Eastern Polynesia, uh, Tahiti, and I just thought imagine Black Panther. Um, recreated for um, a Polynesian stage, especially if Dwayne The Rock Johnson was in it. <laughs> I'm going to put this out there this, this morning. Um, uh, Witty. I'm going to seed it amongst New Zealand right now. I want a collaboration between Witi Hamada and Taika Waititi. Yay, I'd, I'd be on for that. <laughs> I really would be on for that because he is such an energetic person with a huge and great sense of of comedy and he also has a sense of self which is really um, distinctive and because of all of those things I think that he's he's an agent provocateur you know and most uh, uh, people who are involved in our arts and in our literature do have to be um, provocative in that same way and try to keep on pushing uh, New Zealand um, further and further into the future and what we could be. Like um, Carl Jung, he had this idea of having, um, he called them uh, mana personalities. So he, Carl Jung, must have known about 
uh, uh, Polynesia and um, Māori. So he he said that the mana personality was um, the, um, the the symbol of the collective consciousness. And what I love about the whole concept of the mana personality is that uh, people like Taika, all of our creative artists, they do have this mana personality. And what they're trying to do is trying to uh, to show the world uh, just what um, um, New Zealanders um, are at the moment mm. and how we are trying to, to bring that same sense of mana, that same sense of, um, of whānau, that same sense of iwi, that same sense of tribe, that same sense of ihi or energy, wiki, um, dread um, um, to our work. And in that way... We can create here a world that nobody's ever seen before. And that's what I've always tried to do in my work. I like people to think that they, when they um, take up one of my books, um, I have given them a book that they can hongi with or press noses with. I like to think that uh, with uh, my first book, Ponamu Ponamu, um, they are able to access the pito of the book, which is its birth cord, which goes down into um, the marae. I like to think that with the um, uh, the fourth book, the Matriarch, that as well as the is pressing noses with the book because it's a more political book, um, and as well as going down through the pitor to the marae, that they are also accessing the putake, and the putake is the taproot that will take them down to the mythology um, that informs um, the Matriarch, and so that mythology happens to be the the story of Tafaki and his grandmother Faitari and that relationship in mythology. But I also like to think that in the matriarch they then access the intertext of the book because I've tried to be very, very clever in that book mm. and involved Greek mythology in it as well. So that's the intertext of it. So all, all writers, what we do is that we, we try to create... Um, uh, a sphere out of a circle. We try to, to, to make a hologrammatic um, construction. And because I'm Māori, I'm always thinking, so how can I make the square on the page into a box? Or how can I make the triangle on the page into um, a pyramid? Or how can I, in some way, make this into a, a multidimensional work? So I like to think of my work as being multidimensional. And, for instance, I wrote a book called um, The Uncle's Story, it's a novel, and it is based on that ur text or original text. Right, and it is, um, it is the, the same Tafaki myth. Um, a boy um, tries to find out about his uncle who went to Vietnam, um, but instead of uh, Tafaki being a heterosexual um, construction, um, the boy in the story is gay. So it's about a gay Tafaki. So as I say, you always have to be um, an Asian provocateur. Mm, yeah. Always try and push your work and try and, and, and give it new shapes for new peoples and new... Very, um, very interesting stuff. Yeah. We'll, we'll touch on, if we have time, for some of those books and themes a little bit later too. But um, let's go back further into your life, uh, Witsi, and where it all began. You were born and raised uh, in Gisborne. What was life like for you growing up? Well, you know, I never wanted to leave Gizzy. I've always wanted to be a farmer. My father was a farmer. Um, my my mother was a farmer. Uh, my father was a shearer. She was um, a shearer. Dad um, had his own farm in those days, which was pretty incredible for a Māori man to have um, your own farm. And it wasn't um, tribal land. Uh, I felt very, very secure there. Um, the greatest person in my life was and still is my grandmother, Teria. And all my life I have been actually writing about her because so she, she was a key influence. Oh, yes. Mm. yes she was. She was. In, in fact, uh, you know, there, there, there is in, in Māori um, this whole um, lot of grandmothers. And in my case, I was, you know, I grew up with, with many grandmothers and many aunties. So um, they created the kind of cradle for my life. So I left um, um, the valley, I guess, first of all, you know, when I was five. And I then had to go to school um, at a, um, a native school, uh, 
uh, in a, a Pākehā settlement called Patutahi, which is not too far from Waituhi. And um, on the first day, my grandmother said to me, well, you know, you're going to this school. I hope that you do well. And I came back from that school and she was waiting for me. And she said, so what great new wisdom did you learn at school? And I said, well, I learned a, a nursery rhyme about Jack and Jill. And she kept she answer, asked me all these questions. Who are Jack and Jill? Why is, is Jack wearing a crown? Um, it's his own fault if he bra- falls and down and breaks it. And then she said, and what? And what are they doing climbing up a hill to fetch water? What a stupid place to put a well. <laughs> I've never thought of that. Yeah, so the next time I went to school and she, and I came back and I saw her there and she, you know, I wasn't keen to, you know, to tell her what I'd learnt because it was Little Miss Muffet. And so, you know, I recited it and she said, so who's Little Miss Muffet? What is a tuffet? Well, I didn't know what a tuffet was. And uh, uh, what are curds and whey? You know, and then she said, hey, what a stupid girl to be frightened of a spider. Why didn't she say kia to it and put it out of harm's way? So, as I, as you've said, she was very important in my life because she taught me that it all depends on the story that you hear. Um, there are messages within all of those particular um, European tropes uh, uh, that are anathemic to uh, Māori culture. And... Um, that I should always question. So when I started to write, um, which was uh, when I was in my um, my teens and I was a schoolboy at Te Karaka District High School, we were given a book to read of New Zealand um, short stories and an anthology, and in it there was one story which I thought was incredibly malevolent towards Māori, so I threw it out the window and I got the cane for it. However, that really um, impressed me with um, an urgent desire, a moral imperative, and that moral imperative was to write the Māori story and write it in such a way that I could put the Māori story alongside Catherine Mansfield's Mm. stories and alongside Frank Sargison's stories and Janet Frame's stories and all of those wonderful Pākehā writers so that in the end we would grow up with all of these families, because the one family that was missing in New Zealand literature was the Māori whānau. Let's, this is a life and influences of uh, Wuti Ihamaira. Let's um, jump, into some, some, just some, jump into some music. Was music, has music been a big part of your life, Wuti? Well, you know, I've always thought that um, uh, the reo um, is the singing word. And of course, on the marae, there's always singing, there's always um, kapahaka. So I've actually grown up with an oral tradition um, that sings its stories, um, that sings its histories, that sings its myths. And some people sometimes say to me quite wrongly that I'm a storyteller, but I'm not, I'm a story singer. So both Māori and European music, especially the music that I heard over the radio, was really important to me. And one of those, of course, was Paul Robeson, who was a black singer, a black opera singer. And not only a black opera singer, but an extremely um, influential politician in trying to get black rights um, uh, more positively addressed in um, the United States. But to do that, he actually had to go to the UK and to Russia, where he was lauded. So he um, he sings a, a particular song, which is the canoe song from a film called Sanders of the River. And if you listen to the words, you'll understand why I love the song so much. <laughs> Now, from Gisborne, Witty, you headed to Auckland University for three years, but didn't finish your degree. You didn't finish it until you moved to Wellington a, a, a few years later. What of these days, what do you re- recall of these particular days? Well, you know, you're seeing a person who used to think that he was a dumb ass, as the Americans would say. <laughs> I mean, I, um, I took five year, uh, three years to get my school certificate, another three years to get my university entrance. I was 18 by the time I left Gisborne Boys High. 
In fact, um, Mr. Gray, who was the headmaster, didn't want me in because he felt that I was... I'd, I'd had my chance, and he was right. But my mother was such a strong person, and she felt that education was the right of every every New Zealander. And so I... Uh, I stayed there, and then I went to Auckland University, and I bummed out there after five years, and I failed uh, Māori, not just once or twice, but three years running. So you see before you a person who um, has made his reputation as a Māori writer, but who doesn't know the real. So I failed at Auckland University. I then went to... um, to Wellington, where I married, and it was my wife and my then uh, boss, Fred Layton, who worked in the post office, because I was working in the post office at the time, who persuaded me to to go back. So another five years later, I finally finished my degree. He sounds like quite an influence for someone to actually recognise the absolute potential in you. You know, he was um, part of the executive suite of the post office, and he heard that there was this postman, me, who... um, um, had actually worked in the Gisborne Herald uh, in, in Gisborne, but was working in what they called savings bank division in the post office. And so he thought, oh, you know, we should get him into something that's more in line with what uh, with what he does and what he knows. And so um, he put me into um, uh, public relations division. And James K. Baxter had been in that division. Yes. And so had Marilyn Duckworth and some other writers. So that became really important for me to know that they had been there and maybe I had the opportunity to be mentored there and taught a little bit about how to, to write. And Jill Shadbolt, Morris Shadbolt's wife, was one of my my great Gosh. teachers. There's a story in that, isn't there, the influence of the New Zealand Postal Service? Uh, <laughs> well, you know, it was, the largest, it was the largest department, the largest government department um, of, of, of the time, and we're talking here about the 1970s. I mean, every every town and every small um, village had a post office, and it was it was a savings bank. It was a place where you could post letters. You could get married there. Um, uh, you could get the new, um, the weather there. People used to congregate there, and so it's a, a huge sadness to me uh, that uh, you know the post office is not no longer that community place because in those days New Zealand did have a social contract, and so for me, um, the post office became a metaphor of what I should I should do, and that is to maintain the social contract as far as Māori Pākehā relationships were concerned. So um, I began by writing uh, Pōnamu, Pōnamu, and then Fano and then Tangi. And um, after those three, they came out one a year. Um, I then realised something's wrong here because it's just too easy. So I gave up writing 14 years to study how to write, not realising that the spontaneity of my writing, because some of my best writing is in, in, in those days, was the reason why I was writing so fast. You gave it for 10 years. I did. And the irony is that um, then another um, 30 years later, I rewrote those first three books. I think as a writer, what happens is that you're learning all the time. The writer that I was um, in those days is not the same writer that I am now. I mean, I'm so clever and so wise, yeah, right. <laughs> and I've had all of this experience. Like I um, I was in the post office and then Fred Layton got a, um, a phone call from Frank Corner. It was kind of like past the parcel because Frank Corner was the secretary of uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And so Frank Corner asked me to come over and see him because the New Zealand Prime Minister at the time, Norman Kirk, had been on a plane with the US ambassador and my first book had just come out. And Mr Kirk had never read it, but the American ambassador said, oh, you might be interested in this young boy, he's Māori, who um, has just written this book. So Mr Kirk read it, rang Frank up and said, why don't you interview this man? this boy, to come over and see if he's interested in diplomacy. Well, I didn't know what bloody hell diplomacy was. You know, I asked people and I was happy, you know, being a postie. Um, But I went over and um, Frank Corner interviewed me and I said to him, well, the only reason why you want me over here is because I'm Māori. 
And he went, well, actually, yes. <laughs> So when he said that, what could I do? You know, I mean, what he was saying, in, in effect, that he was affirming the fact that there was a possibility for Māori culture to be invested within our diplomatic procedures well, and practices. Well, it looks extraordinary. I'm just thinking from posty to diplomacy via Norm Kirk. Oh, my did, God. Did, did, then you, I spent did you ever 14... meet Norm Kirk? I did. What was he like? Did. Um, he was... An extraordinary taniwha is what um, um, what we would call him. Um, and in those times, he was regarded as this um, person um, who had evolved from not just being prime minister, but but from that into being a rangatira and to being able, um, by his very charisma, to be able to recreate for Māori at that time um, the opportunities for our mythology, for our um, uh, our history, to, uh, to to become real in terms of um, of um, recreating the possibility for land to be given back. And during his time, of course, Matt Rata was a major, major, yes, he the was a major, Tortura, major figure. The they called Norm Kirk, didn't they? They did call yeah, him that. Yeah. So in, in those days, we can then begin to see um, the change in um, New Zealand's policies, which saw more and more uh, treaty issues being addressed. And I think it's really great today because in those days, there were only four Māori MPs. And then uh, there were some ministers like uh, Maturata. Um, but now look at, you know, look at our, our parliament. Out of a parliament of 120, there are 38 who are either Māori, Polynesian or Asian. That is a third, a third of our parliament. Not only that, our parliament is now imbued with the understanding that the relationship between Māori and Pākehā should be part of the cornerstone for New Zealand's development. Apart from that, I think there's been around about 80 of the treaty claims that have been addressed. No other country in the world has absolutely um, um, put itself on that path of reconciliation, not just in terms of apologies to Māori, but also in terms of uh, of um, financial um, redress, but also cultural redress. It's an amazing situation. And um, as well as that, we're seeing a huge change in our demograph- demographics. Mm. There are some people who are saying that in in, in 10 or 20 years, um, there will be more Māori and Polynesian and Asian people in Auckland um, than there are Pākehā. So what that means is not that it's a danger to Pākehā, it's just that that partnership will now become more um, um, in, uh, more part of the Māori putea or the Māori contribution in Whakatāne, um, there, the Māori population is now larger than the Pākehā population. I want to touch on, you mentioned, you've mentioned a couple of times, but I want to touch on uh, Pōnāme Pōnāme because it was, uh, you know, an important book for you, wasn't it? Uh, and I've actually been rereading it, and I've, I've, which has been wonderful for me, and I recall a story just comes to mind, that wonderful hockey tournament story, or the one where a Pākehā family, um, you know, is neighbours with the, I think it's the Heremaias, uh, and you see this wonderful bicultural dance between the two families. Families, which kind of really spoke to a uh, Aotearoa that I, I grew up in, in Manarewa. Um, th- this is a big book for you, wasn't it? It was a big book, and I'm, yeah, I like the way you, you said it's, it's a bicultural dance. All of my work, in fact, has been trying to find a dance partner like that, and the dance partner that I've usually chosen is a, a Pākehā audience. You know, I'm really saying to them in Pōnamu, Pōnamu, hey, come and haka with us, you know. Come and mihi the book, come and haka with us, come and sing a few songs with us, you know, be part of this, um, be part of the story. So I try to recreate the story. So my father is so much a part of that book and of, of Tangi, and um, I've chosen another piece of music, which is, a man whistling, because whenever I think of my father, I think of this farmer out in the hills whistling to his dogs. Do you want to jump into that now? Pardon? Do you want to jump into that song now? I'd love to hear it. Okay, t- tell us what's it called. It's the song from The High and the Mighty.
that is the high and mighty uh, Dimitri Tiomkin, is that right? Explain a bit more of that significance. What a wonderful track. Uh, well, uh, the movie itself is um, stars John Wayne, <laughs> and he's a um, um, the pilot of a plane that's leaving from Hawaii, going to Los Angeles. And so, when I think of my father, I always think of somebody like that, sensitive, in control. But he knows that he has to get his family to a particular destination, and he had eight of us. I, I came from this family of eight. And our father was um, the most amazingly fair and equitable person. And so was my mother. I mean, when I was in my teenage years, and, and of course in those days, you know, boys could go out and girls had to stay at home. But they both used to say to me, no, Witty, you have to take your sisters with you. And so dad would say, you know, as long as you get back by midnight, because not one minute after midnight, because he thought that one minute after midnight, things happened. You know, you did it after midnight. So we always, always had to get home before midnight. And um, so I would take my sisters and say to them, you be here for me to pick you up at 11. Another sister, you be here. To pick, I'll pick you up at quarter past 11. Another sister, you be here at half past 11 so that I could pick them up and take them all home by midnight. They were never there. One was up Kitey Hill with her boyfriend. Another one was down the beach with her boyfriend. So I'd have to go around and find them. But my father was this wonderful person. There's a, there's a really cool story. I, I, th- I think I read about your dad and that uh, when he buys the farm, I think he buys off a park here, um, uh, a, a family. Uh, and they used to um, allow shooting uh, from other people on, on the farm. But your dad didn't want shooting on that farm. And so when people come and start shooting on your dad's farm, he goes, no. You know, I own this land now. I own this farm. And the park here, people who came on to shoot didn't believe him. No. And um, so I was in a, in one of the rooms looking at them, and they had guns and Dad didn't. So there were three of them and Dad, and it was looking really, really dangerous. So Dad had a rifle in his wardrobe, so I got the rifle and I pointed it out the window just to make just to let them know. What? That, oh, yeah, because, you know, it was dangerous. Um, they were arguing with him. They were three against one. And uh, it was, you know, I felt that, that there was the capacity for violence. So in, in, in all of my work and, and, and all of my life, I've tried to stand up in that way. And the way in which I've, I've found it um, most um, powerful is um, through literature to make sure that I can point out the window and ensure that people are aware that Māori must be listened to. You become more political in your writings in the mid-70s, don't you? The new net goes fishing uh, among the stories that was influencing you around this time. What was going on here uh, for you? Uh, So there I was, and I had written these first three books, which were all what I call pastoral. They were all set in um, Waituhi. Uh, but at the time, I was living in Wellington, so I understood that um, the urban uh, migration of Māori to, um, uh, to the cities had created an enormous impact on what was happening in cities and uh, the collision of, of two cultures. And so um, uh, the New Net Goes Fishing uh, was the first of those opportunities that I took to try to reflect what was happening for Māori in the cities. And I've always said of myself that what I am is a witness for my times. So I was trying to witness my times by doing these more aggressive stories. And that is when I created for myself a formula. And that formula was aesthetics plus the politics of difference equals the Māori story. And the first three books had been beautiful aesthetics, not so much politics. But the fourth book was a political. And then with the fifth book, which was The Matriarch, I then decided that I would then, instead of continuing to spiral outward, to spiral downward and create um, what I thought was the um, appropriate um, and traditional Māori approach to writing the novel, which was to create um, the multi-generational saga 
um, a story that was about a family over three or four or five generations. And just mm. about all of my work since then has been that kind of spiralling down into three or four or five generations. Mm. Mm. There is that book, of course, uh, The Whale Rider, in 1987, and, of course, that fantastic, equally fantastic movie by Nicky Curra, as, yeah. you, as you mentioned there. What changed for you with The Whale Rider? Well, um, <laughs> yeah, a heap of things changed for me with The Whale Rider. Um, first of all, I had written it in New York after I had been in, in foreign affairs and my daughters were coming to see me, and I always liked to give them a present. So I wrote uh, The Whale Rider in six weeks. I sometimes um, say eight weeks to make few people feel better. <laughs> yes, but th the writing process, I, I think what I've been doing Wallace is writing these stories and novels and also the um, the the operas I've done the musicals I've done the plays that I've done the um, the editing work that I've done are like um, I've now done around about the same number of lyrical pieces for the theater 14 or 15 that I've done uh, novels and it's similar with the um, the edited work the anthologies there's around about 14 or 15 of them so it's just because dad taught me how to work, you know. He used to say, well, it beats um, digging in fence posts, you know, whenever I was feeling, oh, this is getting too hard. I want to talk a bit about um, a book, The Nights in the Garden of Spain, with you. Uh, in 1996, you bring your sexuality to the fore with a gay novel. What was the reaction? Oh, the reaction was actually about the same as with the winners and losers, Big Brother, Little Sister, because Big Brother, Little Sister um, was not um, entirely welcomed uh, because of its the way in which um, it depicted um, um, the abusive nature of, uh, of the relationship between the mother and uh, the number of men that she has in her life. And so it was a kind of precursor of um, Alan Duff's uh, Once We're Warriors. With um, Nights in the Gardens of Spain, I had been happily married and I had two children, uh, but I knew that um, it was time for me to address that other nature of mine, which was um, the, uh, the, um, the gay nature of my life. Um, it had become an intolerable secret. And that whole business of being an agent provocateur, that whole business of pushing yourself, of searching for excellence, of looking yourself in the eye and telling the truth, um, which is one of uh, Catherine Mansfield's great, um, great sayings, you know, act for yourself, tell the truth. And uh, trying to address that, uh, that, that uh, truth, um, I wrote this novel um, about a gay man who's married with two children and who has met a young lover and wants to come out. Uh, and the whole way in which coming out means not just um, the destruction of his life and the um, development of a new one, mm. but it destroys everything. It destroys the life of his wife. It destroys the life of his children. And then they have to try to find some way of pulling it all back together again. But then... The message is a very positive one. The message is also that um, all of us have to find who we are. And even when you do that, then the phoenix can, can arise and, and you can get over it. And you can then be, um, you can then achieve your own sovereignty as my, my wife and my children have done mm. and as I have done. I feel, mm. you know, as if I, well, when the book came out, I felt a huge sense of release. I could imagine, yeah. You mentioned New York earlier. Touch on um, your time overseas a little bit for us, uh, Witty. I mean, you, you, you got a Fulbright re residency in world literature at George Washington University, um, but you spent some time in New York. How, how was your period in the States? What was, it, what was it like? Well, what was exciting was being able to represent uh, government in the United States at the time when um, New Zealand and America... Uh, were uh, undergoing a, a very, very difficult uh, relationship because um, Mr. Longy um, had decided that, and the Labour government had agreed that um, um, 
we would require uh, American um, US um, vessels that were nuclear armed or nuclear powered uh, or, or were carrying um, uh, u- nuclear um, weapons um, to to tell us and because of that um, the diplomatic uh, relationship at that level was totally destroyed so we had to keep it going by maintaining those other relationships like trade, uh, like culture, um, like finance, um, and and continue to establish for ourselves that kind of relationship. So we were part of what was known as the ANZUS um, group. And so therefore it was really exciting to be there and to know that, uh, you know, um, there was this huge job uh, to do. And so one of the selections that I chose then is of a soprano um, named Renata Tibaldi, and she's singing an aria called Io son l'umile ancella. Well, the words are interesting because the words are, I am a humble servant of the arts. Um, the creative genius gives me these words, um, which I try to impart to the hearts of men. And in New York, what I discovered was this wider group of people, these artists, and they were all creating a world product. So what I learned there was we, as New Zealanders, needed not to think of ourselves just as New Zealand artists and writers and and people who um, uh, were creating for New Zealand, but what we were doing was also creating world-beating culture. You know, in terms of um, in terms of such a stellar career as yours, there will be the stars, but there will also be the deep valleys. Uh, and I suppose one of the deep valleys is, and you've discussed it uh, in other forms as well, but this plagiarism business uh, of uh, the Troina Sea, uncovered by the very publication that had given you your first break. Um, how difficult was that a period for you, being accused of plagiarism in a novel, for all to see. Okay, so what got me through that was love, you know, the love of people. And there's a Māori saying which goes, I paru i te tinana, ka mau i te wai, i paru i te aroha, ka mau tonu e. which means if you are brushed with dirt, you can wipe it off. If you are brushed with love, it lasts forever. So while I was um, writing the story, um, which involved, I mean, all of my books at that time were huge. You know, it was 500 pages mm. long. And I was doing a lot of research. And um, I also did the same thing with um, Sleep Standing, a lot of research. So sometimes when you research, you make mistakes. And I made these mistakes. And so um, there are around about uh, 12 incidents where I had not acknowledged the sources um, for these um, for some of the um, the material that I had in the book. Uh, it was a crazy period. I had uh, <laughs> television um, crews um, camped outside my door. Really? Oh yes, yes, and they were following me all over the place. Um, I had people uh, ringing me up, um, asking for interviews. I had. Um, um, you had pressure on your pressure, u- u- university, university to sack you. Well, the thing was, too, that um, I wasn't just in the gun for what I had done, but my publisher um, was also in the gun for having published it. So there were requests for them to pull the book and junk it. Um, The university um, was under pressure to fire me. So they um, were trying to maintain um, their sense of, uh, of integrity. Um, so it was coming from all sides, but as I say, we managed to get through it. Actually, you know, I'll tell you what, at the time, um, 
um, Hone Harawira was also having his problems. So it was really great around about um, the end of my, my, my problematic time when Hone became the, the focus of attention uh, because then uh, the heat went off me onto him. And then Christmas and New Year came. <laughs> and after Christmas and New Year, it was basically over. I, I was getting these fantastic messages from people. I got a phone call on my phone from this guy who was um, on a fishing boat, um, just anchored off the Taranaki coast. And he just left a message saying, well, Woody, you don't know me. I'm on this fishing boat I'm off, Taranaki, off the Taranaki coast, and I'd advise you to do what we do, and that is batten down the hatches and turn the boat into the wind and wait it out. <laughs> <laughs> Some good, solid advice there from a fisherman off the waters. Look, I, I haven't read this true in the sea. I mean, I know that you're still proud of it. You bought 1,800 uh, books back and actually st- stored somewhere. I don't know if they're stored still, um, but is there a plan to resurrect it? Yes, well, my sister, um, Gay, has got them all in her garage back in Gisborne. And um, whenever I'm back home, I make sure that I spend some time. Because, as I say, with my work, I like to hongi my work and I like to mihi to it. So usually I will go in there and I imagine them as being hōhepa. Hōhepa to te umuro himself. So there am I sitting and talking to him and I'm saying to him, well, you know, I'm really sorry this has happened to you, Rangatira. I'm really sorry. Um, and so we just talk. We just talk together. And then at the end of it, I have made him a promise that, uh, you know, I will um, republish it. And when I republish it, I tell you what, it's going to have the best production that you will ever see. I'm hoping to have a velvet cover for it. I'm going to dress him up in good dudes and then put him out there so that he can capture the world. There you go. (laughs) Now... The first volume of your memoir, Māori Boy, a memoir of childhood, covered your life to age 15. And it's a, it's a, this is a fascinating read, this book. Um, published in 2014 and later won the General Nonfiction Award at the Ockham's. But there's a point in the book, it becomes pretty full on, pretty dark. Um, and in it, you talk about being abused, raped as a 12 year old. You've said it was hard to write. Um, reading that, I mean, it's, it's, you, you pull no punches on what happened. How do you feel about that period now? How, and how has it formed you and changed you? Mould did you, Witty? Well, I did not admit that until the book was actually published, A Māori Boy. I had never admitted to it to myself. I had always thought, why should I do that? I mean, you know, I've never really wanted to face up to it. And it wasn't until Harriet Allen, who's my publisher at Penguin Random House, um, she said to me, well, you know, will you write Māori Boy, a memoir, as a means of getting over the Trawena Sea problem. It might be better, she said, if you write something different. So I decided to do that. But, you know, when you write a memoir, then you have to make a choice about how deep you want to go. And I felt that I needed to go deep rather than do the whole book as one, the story as one book. So it's actually going to be three volumes. So Māori Boy is the first of those volumes, and it's um, a memoir of childhood. So when I made the decision to go deep, I then realised, well, where is the cut-off point going yeah. to be? How deep should I go? So in um, Māori Boy, I talked about my grandmother's rape, and then the possibility of my mother's rape. And I said to myself, well, you know, why is it that you can do that, but you have not really um, addressed your own? So be real, Witty. You've, it's either got to be in there or you have to take everything out. So that forced me to, um, to, to uncover um, that particular rape. And it's quite a moment. I, I want to ask you, did it take, I think I, think I read some, somewhere, it, it's taken you, well, it took you many, many years to arrive at that point where you could actually put pen to paper and talk about it. Well, when, when I sent the manuscript to Harriet in 2014, she said to me, well, you know, have you told your 
daughters? Have you told your wife? Have you told your family? And I said, no, I haven't. So then <laughs> I then had to come out of the book and then go home and then tell my whānau and then also tell my daughters and tell Jane, you know, that this had happened. So the interesting thing, though, Wallace, is that I'm, I'm just completing the second volume, which is called Native Son, and it's a um, a writer's memoir. And so now that that whole thing has been uncovered, I've subsequently realised that, in fact, it has informed the whole writing career. So as well as being a memoir, um, the writer's memoir, it is also going to track the way in which that rape affected me throughout my life and the decisions that therefore came out of that and um, those that darkness that you talk about in Māori Boy is much more intense and much more um, darker uh, because um, my sexual um, identity and how I was able to recreate um, out of that and stagger out of stagger and run out of that um, that situation um, I've, I've realized has been a bigger than I thought well it's uh, an honor to have you share your thoughts with you on that and and uh, you know I look forward to um, you know that that book it sounds like you have a wonderful relationship with your children and with Jane well you know they've always been there in my in my life, and everybody needs a family, Wallace. Everybody needs people to cry with and people to laugh with and people who you can absolutely be who you can, you want to be. And um, my daughters now have uh, three um, uh, children, so these are the mukopuna. Um, the that mukos. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, mukos, the mukos that I live my career for. And they're the ones um, that I try to create um, these stories for because they are um, multicultural. They are learning the reo and they're learning, you know, um, Aria comes back from school and she sings me a song in Māori. And I say, where did you get that song from? And she says, oh, we got taught it today, you know. And what I think is mar it's marvellous is the flowering the flowering of New Zealand culture and the fact that from school up um, we are beginning to discover that there is a new kind of mana personality, this new generation. They will begin to recreate mythologies and histories which are different from those that we have had. They will start saving the planet. They will look at what's happening in the Pacific. They will be the ones who... Um, you know, who will be um, concerned for the environment. China is now our second or third most important trading partner. They will learn Mandarin. They will learn all of these languages. They will be the mana personalities. They will be our leaders. Let me ask you, Witty, um, coming back to that idea of the bicultural dance, and I want to ask you, uh, as a person who's been a true pioneer, uh, an innovator uh, in, in, in this area. Um, after 45 plus years, right back to Ponami, Ponami 1972, of talking about Māori park relations, what do you make of the bicultural dance in 2018? I love the fact that um, the, um, the, stru the structural um, nature of New Zealand governance is changing that we have um, a deputy prime minister who's Māori and who's also the leader of a major party, that we have um, a Māori who is the leader of the opposition, um, that we have a Māori who's the co-leader of the Green Party. You know, when you think about the way in which the nature of governance has changed, it's totally amazing. Um, we have Māori and Pacific Islanders and Asians who are beginning to work um, in that um, that structural way because unless we had got there, then there wouldn't have been the opportunity to 
as Mr. Peters always likes to, to, to say, to, to be seated at the table. So it is really wonderful to see um, uh, Māori seated at the table, not only there, but um, in television and radio. Uh, you know, we see um, Māori uh, fronting the news, we see Māori programming, and this is not just for Māori, this is for that bicultural dance, because some people do make the mistake of thinking this is just for Māori, it isn't. We see programs on Māori um, um, Tele uh, Māori television about Anzac Day. We have all of this huge energy. We have, we have, you know, that dance is, is is a dance that's taking place in a new kind of fare, a new kind of meeting house, and it is a dance in which um, Māori and Pākehā are coming from both sides of the of the walls and saying, "May I have this waltz." Before we leave you, we saw a documentary on Māori TV called In Foreign Fields about our people killed in wars overseas, still lying in foreign fields. Um, and your uncle, Rangi, was one of those. And your mother yearned for him to be buried at home. Uh, it, was, it was very touching, Witty. I mean, how important is repatriation for families like yours? The Māori compulsion is to bring them home. There's no doubt about that, the Māori compulsion. It's a, it's a cultural compulsion. It's always been there ever since Māori were fighting each other in, in, in wartime um, events. If a, um, a warrior died on the field, they were always taken back home to be buried. Person, from a personal point of view, when your mother says to you, will you get your uncle or only home? What can you do, you know? So my mother, my darling mother, actually, and my father, they both went over there because my mother had seen Uncle Rangi um, at the window of her house in Hague Street when she was in her 60s. And he had actually said to her, would you like to dance? And so I've written a story saying, you know, that she saw him. And would you like to have the last dance? When I grow too old to dream, I'll have you to remember. So she did go. She did see him. And then 30 years later, I had the opportunity to go when John Keir asked me to go over to do this documentary. And it was the same thing. I went over there. I saw him in, where he was lying with all of these other soldiers. And my compulsion is to bring him home. Do you know what? It's been a total honour to have you on when my I show, Woody. Too old to dream. If I, you, you st we started the hour by you loving my Govan Mackey uh, tweed jacket here. If I wasn't cold, I'd give it to you. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm freezing. No, look, had I known that you were going to wear it, I've got that same gizzy jacket. <laughs> Different colour, but, but same tweed kind of look. Let's go out on one more song. A little bit of Luther Vandross, why not? Why did you choose this one? Well, you know, what's its name? <laughs> Dance with my father. What's it you hear, Mara? Great fit to have you on. Kia ora. Back when I was a child Before life removed all the innocence my father would lift me high and dance with my mother and 